right, thank you. So today I'll talk <coughs> about the Hebrew scheme of points on the plane uh, and its connections to link homology, mostly conjectural, but most partially proved. Uh, and before link homology, I just want to spend some time talking about the Hebrew scheme of C2. So many people here know what it is, but I want to give slightly maybe different perspective and related to Joel's lectures very clearly. So what is the Hebrew scheme of C2? So you have uh, zero dimensional subschemes of C2. So C2 is affine. So the ring of functions uh, on C2 is C of XY, polynomials in two variables. And any zero dimensional subschemes is defined by some ideal. So we're looking at ideals inside C of XY, such that the co-dimension, dimension of C of XY mod I is equal to N. And it turns out that this space is smooth of dimension to N. That's the theorem of Fogarty. Uh, and it is uh, symplectic. So there is an algebraic symplectic form on it, uh, which is non-degenerate everywhere. And in fact, uh, to connect to Joe's lectures, this is an example of symplectic resolution. And I would say it's my favorite person example of symplectic resolution. So I think for Joel, it was T-star P1. For me, like whenever I think of symplectic resolution, I think about this example really. So why it is a resolution and what is the resolution of? So you have a Hebrew Cho map, which sends an ideal to support of the corresponding zero dimensional sub scheme. So support of the quotient of C of XY mod I. And this is N points on C2 with multiplicities. And so you have a map from the Hebrew scheme of N points on C2 to symmetric power of C2. Again, these are just N tuples on ordered and tuples of points. And this set of unordered and tuples of points is very singular uh, and Hebrew scheme is smooth. And in fact, it is a resolution of singularities of the symmetric power. And uh, you can say more. So for example, this is a Poisson variety. It's a fine Poisson variety. <laughs> Uh, and then this is uh, non affine, but this is symplectic variety and the forms agree. And so, one way to see it is to say that what is symmetric power of C2 really? So, the, what are the functions on symmetric power of C2? Well, we have n points with coordinates x1, y1, x2, y2, x3, y3, and so on. So, we have functions on those, and this will be just polynomials in x1 through xn, y1 through yn. And then we quotient by SN. So we take uh, SN invariance where the action of SN is diagonal. We permute axis and Y simultaneously. Uh, and we take the spec of that. And that is clearly a Poisson variety because we can just say that the Poisson bracket of XI and YJ uh, is uh, delta IJ, maybe up to sign. Uh, and uh, so this defines the Poisson bracket on C of X1, Xn, Y1, Yn. It's, it's an invariant, so it defines the Poisson bracket on the SN invariant functions. And so this is a Poisson variety, and this is the resolution of that, which turns out to be symplectic, I think, by result of Boville, if I remember correctly. And additional piece of data, which was very important for Joel's lectures, is that this is a conical symplectic resolution. Uh, and it has an additional torus section. So what are these here? So you have two C directions on C2, uh, which definitely lead to C directions on the Hebrew scheme. So the Hamiltonian torus uh, scales act X by Q and Y by Q inverse. Uh, there is an echo. Uh, there is a little bit of an echo, yeah. So there is a Hamiltonian torus T, um, where which scales x by q and y by q inverse. Uh, so this uh, Hamiltonian torus preserves the standard symplectic form on the plane. And one can prove that it preserves the standard symplectic form on the Huber scheme as well. So this is what Joel denoted by T in his examples. And then you have this conical structure. So you want some dilating cis direction, and this dilating cis direction just dilates everything. So you send x and y to tx and ty. So 
Sometimes people use QNT in slightly different sense, and it doesn't matter that much today, but uh, this is the conical torus, so it scales everything or it shrinks everything if t goes to zero to the most singular fiber, where over zero, uh, and uh, it scales the symplectic form by t to the power two n, I guess. No, t, t square, sorry, t square. Uh, and another piece of data, which was also important, is that given a Hamiltonian torus, you can look at attracting sub variety of this Hamiltonian torus. Or you can look at fixed points, first of all. Uh, yes, maybe let's, let's talk about the fixed points first. So the fixed points for the Hamiltonian torus are monomial ideals. Uh, so you have any partition of N, lambda. So we draw it in French notation because we're in France. Uh, and uh, we fill every box of this partition with monomials in X and Y. So in horizontal direction, we have axes and powers of X. In vertical direction, we have powers of Y. And so in particular, this box will be X to the six. This box will be X to the five Y because it go up by one. This will be X squared Y squared and so on. And this will be Y to the power of four. And then monomial ideal is generated by monomials outside of this Yen diagram in this yellow region. And in this example, the monomial ideal is generated by x to the six, x to the five y, x squared y squared, x y cube, and y to the four. And uh, one can check that all fixed points for the uh, Hamiltonian torus sections are actually isolated. There are finitely many of those, and they're labeled by partitions of n, as I just described. So we are in the setting of uh, Joel's lecture. And final piece of data, uh, which I skipped over, was Lagrangian subvariety or this attracting subvariety. So we look at the locus where uh, the limit at Q goes to zero exists. And if we just look at C2, so we look at the action QX and Q inverse Y, the limit of this thing exists only if Y is equal to zero, because if Y is not equal to zero, this Q inverse Y will blow up and go to infinity. And so if you have n points then, and you have this kind of action, so you want all the points to be on the line when y is equal to zero. And so the attracting sub variety uh, in notations from Joe's lecture, this will be hill band of C2 plus. Uh, so this will be like y plus. Uh, and in more kind of algebra geometric notations is the Hebrew scheme of n points on C2 supported on the line C. And this is the line y is equal to zero. So we're looking at all ideals such that support of c of x y mod i uh, is a subset of y is equal to zero. So all my points are supported on the horizontal line. And one can indeed check, and I mean, this follows from general theory, but one can directly check in this case that this is indeed a Lagrangian sub variety. Uh, it has as many components as um, fixed points. So for each fixed point, you have a attracting subset, which is like all the points which flow into that particular fixed point. Uh, and all of them have dimension n. And you can study singularities of the space and lots of other things, which we will maybe review in a second. And I think that's uh, maybe most what I want to say about the structure of symplectic resolution. So there was some, uh, maybe any questions here? So I hope that most of you have seen this picture at some point or read uh, Nakajima's book where all this is explained very, very nicely and clearly. Uh, and Maybe one last comment, which is not so important. So Joel mentioned category O uh, for this action. So we want to quantize modules or shifts on the Hubert scheme supported on this Lagrangian. And the quantization is known and well studied by many people. And it's known as rational Chernyuk algebra. So maybe I'll just say it as a word. It, it's not important for what I will say later. It's kind of related to what I said last time, uh, but just to connect things, so spherical, rational, Trinic algebra.
in the quantization. of this picture. And in particular, there is a notion of category O uh, where things are supported on this Lagrangian and there is a lot of interesting studies. So you can look at, I don't know, Edingo's lectures on Turnick algebras and all this is discussed in detail. Uh, question, echo is gone now. Okay, right. So any questions? No questions, good. So let's keep going. So we need a bit more structure there. Uh, ah, okay. So a bit more structure is that we have, because it's not a fine, we need to study some interesting uh, bundles on the Hebrew scheme. And the most obvious bundle is the tautological bundle T. So I think in Richard's notations would be E, but I stick with T. So this is a rank n vector bundle over the Hebrew scheme uh, and the fiber over an ideal is just the quotient of CFXY by that ideal. So this is really a vector bundle of rank n. And uh, given T, you can cook up lots of other vector bundles by taking sure functors. Uh, in particular, you can have determinant of T or n's exterior power of T. And this is known as O of one. Um, so this is a line bundle on the Hebrew scheme. And in fact, it's an ample line bundle. So Hebrew scheme is non, not a projective variety because non-compact, but it's a, you have embedding into some projective bundle over something affine using this of one. Let's say it this way. Said differently, uh, maybe another way to think about this O of one is to say that this is a resolution of singularity. This is actually a blow up of some explicit ideal in here in somatic power. And then O of one is associated with that blow up. Anyway. Uh, question. How one has to change the uh, underlying space to get trigonometric or elliptic. Uh, yeah, so for trigonometric, we have to consider the Hebrew scheme of C cross C star uh, or potential bound to C star. Uh, and for elliptic, I guess I'm not an expert, but maybe you need something like T star for elliptic curve. I don't know. I forgot. Uh, anyway. So what I think, what I want to say in connections to Joel's lectures, just to uh, close this uh, general introduction, is that in fact, many people uh, started from Nakajima and then later on the other side by Braverman, Finkelberg and Nakajima identified the Hubert scheme of C2 with both the Higgs and Coulomb branch of the same theory. So, in the notations of Joel's lecture yesterday, we have to choose a group and representation. So the group is GLN. Uh, representation is uh, the Lie algebra of GLN or joint representation plus CN. And it corresponds to this quiver where I have one vertex with label N, one loop corresponding to this kind of operator in the Lie algebra of GLN. And this uh, CN corresponds to the framing uh, which goes from the vertex Frame and vertex with label one, uh, which goes to this vertex with label n. And then again, it's quite classical by now that this is the Higgs branch of this theory. So if you take cotangent bundle to n uh, and quotient by g, with this, I guess, triple quotient, whatever. Uh, so this is the Hubert scheme. And this is explained, for example, in Nakajima's book. And more recently, Braverman and Finkelberg and Nakajima uh, proved that if you do this Coulomb branch construction with the fine grass minings and all this stuff from last Joe's lecture, you recover this quiver. And so for people who like geometric representation theory, this is a fine A1 quiver with framing. And so it turns out to be self-dual under this magical um, symmetry. And uh, we will kind of see this uh, some instances of this uh, in a little bit, although, I mean, I'm not sure you can recognize these instances of being the Coulomb branch or being the Higgs branch from my talk. Anyway.
Okay, so this is just the connection to symplectic resolutions, and this is like always good to think to about it. And like one thing which I want to emphasize, which will appear a lot today, is that you have this Lagrangian sub variety. So it, you can look at this Hebrew scheme of points uh, supported on a line, and it's not completely random thing. It comes from this very general construction of symplectic resolution and action of Hamiltonian torus. Uh, and we come to the main uh, conjecture uh, of myself, Andre Nigud, and Jake Rasmussen. And by now, uh, it is my understanding that it's mostly proven by uh, Alexey Blonkov and Lev Rozansky. So they have uh, five or six very long papers in archive, and they're working on even more. So I think most of the details are wrote, uh, written out already, and then there are maybe some subtleties which they finish it. But I think most of the conjecture is now proven by Blomkov and Rosansky. Uh, so starting from a braid on n strands, uh, you build a sheaf, or strictly speaking, an object in derived category. And I don't want to talk about subtleties and homological algebra here. But uh, for now, it is just C star cross C star variant sheaf on the Hebrew scheme of points. And not on the whole Hebrew scheme of points, on this Lagrangian sub variety on Hill band of C2, C. And so it is supposed to be C star cross C star variant with respect to both conical and the Hamiltonian action. And uh, the most important part of the conjecture uh, is that you can actually recover back uh, the triply graded homology of your braid from uh, this thing. So you take shift cohomology. So this is a coherent shift. Maybe I should say this because yesterday we saw some constructible shift. So this is really coherent shift. Uh, and so you take shift cohomology of Hebrew scheme of n points on C2 support on a line. Uh, and you take this shift and you tensor, you can take it by itself. That's already fine and good for most purposes. But if you really want to get the full cohomology, you tensor it with the exterior algebra of you know, tautological bundle. So unlike previous talk today, so this T is not the tangent bundle. This is really the tautological bundle. Maybe I should uh, write it here explicitly. So this is a dual tautological bundle. Uh, and then you take because the sheaf is C star cross C star covariant and the tautological bundle is C star cross C star covariant, you just take the space of sections. It has a natural or higher cohomology if there are any. Uh, so you take the character of C star cross C star action on that. Uh, and that's your answer. So this thing is naturally triply graded. Uh, so a degree comes from this part, from exterior algebra of tautological or dual tautological. Uh, Q and T degree uh, come from uh, the action of C star and C star uh, on the plane on the Hebrew scheme and on the uh, sheaf. And you have to be careful, strictly speaking, if you do have higher cohomology here. So if you don't have higher cohomology, this is a complete answer and that's well understood. If you do have higher cohomology, they are incorporated all together in a slightly weird way. And this homological degrees also is related to Q and T in a very subtle way, uh, which I'm not going to talk about. But in many examples that we'll see today, actually you don't have higher cohomology, so you don't need to worry about that part, but that, that's the most subtle part here. And again, so then the question is, well, so why do we care? As always is the question. So, and again, you can read it in two ways. So one way is to say, well, so you have an interesting shift on the Hebrew scheme. Can we interpret it as invariant of some link and maybe get some intuition or some kind of structural results from the uh, link homology, which might help us. And we might see some example, or at least I'll say some examples about this. Uh, and in the other direction, I mean, and originally this is like was the main motivation for this conjecture is that we really want to compute HHH of beta or we want to understand what it is and how to think about it properly. 
And if we can guess the sheaf of beta, we have lots of different tools to compute this right hand side. So we have equivalent localization to fixed points. We have, uh, in under nice circumstances, we have homology vanishing. Uh, we have other tools just directly studying geometry of the Hebrew scheme to compute these things. So I will give you very, very explicit examples where we know this sheaf of beta very, very explicitly when we can compute the right hand side. And so historically, this was the main computational tool to make predictions about HHH. And in many cases, like now, these predictions are proven. Uh, and that's the structure. So what else do we know about this uh, sheaf? So the action of, as I said a couple of times already, there is an action of polynomial algebra on HHH of beta. And if we don't close the braid, we really have 10 different variables. And if we close the braid, they close up according to cycles in the corresponding permutation or uh, components, connected components in the link. And so these axes are just positions of the point somehow here. So we have Hebrew scheme of endpoints in a line. We have endpoints, they're all in a line and their coordinates are xi. And so in particular, the action of these variables correspond to the choice of support of the shape of beta. And very concretely, if beta, for example, is a naught, then all xi must act the same way on HHH of beta. And that we discussed several times. But on the right hand side, this means that my sheaf is not a random thing. It's actually supported on the punctual Hubert scheme of n points. So all points must be the same. And after a shift, we can assume that all points are actually at zero. And so whenever we're talking about HHH of beta and beta closes to a naught, uh, we are talking about the shift not on the whole thing, not on the whole Hebrew scheme, not on the Lagrangian sub yeah, but actually about the shift just on the central fiber on the Hebrew scheme of C2 supported the origin. And uh, one concrete example, which was again kind of motivating for most of things and developments that I've talked about in this course and most of developments that was in last 10 years here. Uh, is that if you you have a torus node of type n k n plus one, uh, then your sheaf is actually clear. So your sheaf is the line bundle of k on the punctual Hubert scheme of points on C two. So again, let me repeat that you have this line bundle of one on the Hubert scheme of points. You just raise it into power k if k is positive. Let's say, but actually k could be negative as well and. Maybe let me not write it, not to confuse you. So if K is positive, uh, you know a lot about the sheaf and it's homology vanishing. If K is negative, this is still true, but uh, it's much more subtle. And I can't erase it, I'm sorry. Uh, and this is very explicit prediction. And many people starting from Mark Heyman studied this answer. And I will mm, maybe give you a more concrete example in a second. But this is kind of one very specific uh, instance of this conjecture, uh, which tells us a lot. So in the right hand side, we have very specific line bundle on the punctual Hubert scheme, uh, tensor with a vector bundle fine. And then you want to compute its uh, space of sections or shift cohomology. You can do it by many tools and Heyman did it for you uh, in some sense. And so you just, uh, uh, have an answer on the right hand side, but to compute the left hand side, it took really a while and about like 10 years to confirm this prediction. So, I don't know how to raise this, fine. Uh, and then another feature of this conjecture and of the shift is that what happens if you add a full twist? So I don't know, maybe I should. You can put TNN, uh, I think later I will call it F to confuse everyone. Uh, so you have the full twist braid where you have N strands and you turn it uh, around and then they come back to the same position. Oh, okay. How is this conjecture related to braid varieties? It's in no way. 
related to braid varieties, as far as I know? Uh, that's a very good question, uh, which uh, uh, maybe I'll give some comment in the end, but uh, as far as I know, uh, I mean, these are just different models. So you have three different models for uh, lean homology. So maybe uh, let me just summarize this before we go on. So you have uh, lean homology is related to braid varieties, and that is definitely proven. And that's essentially the work of Webster Williamson plus other work of uh, Mellet, Trin, and others. Uh, then you have this uh, Huber schemes and single curves, which I've talked about last time. And that's a very different thing. And uh, the relation between the two is also not understood. So maybe I'll, okay. Sorry, my computer is weird. I don't know. One second. Okay. So you have uh, three algebra geometric models for link homology. And so just to put everything in context, so you have the braid varieties. And then you have Hubert's scheme of single curve. And then you have Hilbert of C2. And there are three very different things. So here you have homology of some smooth, uh, non-compact algebraic variety with weight filtration. Uh, here you have homology of compact but uh, singular variety. And the question is, what is the relation? So this is known to be related to lean homology. So this is done. Uh, then this is still uh, conjectural how this is related to lean homology, except for examples where we can compute things. And the relation between the two is supposed to be some kind of non-abelian Hodge uh, theory, which I don't know anything about, but I've talked about last time. Uh, and uh, then you can ask, what is the relation between this and the conjecture that I just said? And again, that's a very good question, which is mm, not, I would say, understood at all. So. Physicists would say that this is some kind of geometric engineering. Uh, the relation here is kind of emerging, and I will talk about. Uh, but like just purely by terms of algebraic geometry, I don't know immediately how to see this. So uh, maybe one way to get from braid varieties to the Hubert scheme. So just uh, for Joel, so there is a relation to character shifts here, and one can hope that there is a relation between some kind of derived version of character shifts in the Huber scheme of C2. So maybe this would go through character shifts and I will say a couple of sentences later. But again, this is not understood at all, I would say. And um, the relation here is kind of emerging slightly better, but this is only for algebraic knots and it's still not clear. So, I mean, all this is, pretty much conjectural and that's why this is hard. So uh, what Oblomkov and Rosansky did, I will say in a second, and they did something very different. So they, didn't, they didn't relate to braid varieties and they didn't really use geometry here. They did something different. Yeah, sorry, I didn't really answer the question, but uh, I don't have much to say. Any other questions? Okay. All right, so I'll come back to this question and maybe say more and confuse people. One more question, Eugene. Uh-huh. Yeah, uh, I just didn't quite understand in your hearing the, the, the second point, the link between the action of Xi and the support of F. Uh, just how is this uh, connection there? Yeah, so if you have any issue, so you have Xi, or rather like semantic functions of Xi, there are global functions on this Hilbert of C2C, right? 
So what are the global functions on the Hilbert scheme? As I said, there's a just symmetric function in x's and y's. So if all y's are equal to zero, then symmetric function on x's are global functions on this thing. And so in particular, any module uh, is uh, a, a, any shift on the Hilbert scheme gives you a module over the symmetric functions. And this is supposed to match to this action of xi on the left. So that's one way to say it. Another way to say it is that you have a map from the Hilbert scheme of C to C, and you have just a map to symmetric power of C, where again, you have n points on the line. And so the coordinates here are the symmetric functions that I talked about, uh, and they should act. Or you can just look at the image. And so these n points here are supposed to correspond to coordinates xi over there. OK? OK, thank you. Good. Uh, and so, yeah, so in particular, if all x i act by uh, zero on the left, this means that the shift is supported on like zero, 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 zero. If all x i act the same way, this means that uh, all points uh, in the support of the shift are the same uh, and, or like push forward to SNC if you want, uh, are the same. And uh, uh, up to a shift, you can assume that this same point is zero. So this is easy to uh, achieve. Okay, fine. And then another general property, which uh, is very useful in practice, is that if I have a braid beta and I add a full twist to the braid, uh, then the corresponding shift is just multiplied by the line bundle of one. And that is, uh, in some constructions, this kind of comes for free. In some construction, this is really hard to prove. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that if I have time. Uh, and so even more concrete examples, kind of unpacking. Oh, sorry. Can you see me? Hello? Yes. Can okay, see. yeah, sorry, my computer almost crashed and uh, I don't know what happened. Uh, so even more concrete than this example, if you have a trefoil knot, T to three, uh, then the corresponding shift is O of one on the Hebrew scheme of two points on C2 supported at the origin. So the Hebrew scheme of two points on C2 is CP1, is P1. And so we're counting sections of O of one on P1. This is a two dimensional space. Uh, and we know how to compute it. We can do it equivalently. We get Q plus T. And I just realized I changed my Q and T from the beginning of the lecture, but that's fine. It's still two dimensional space. And this two dimensional space matches the uh, uh, two dimensional space that we saw before. And so uh, maybe, uh, yeah. And another example uh, that beta is T3, 4, uh, 3, 4 torus node. That's kind of the first really interesting example. And the, line, the shift is still O of 1, but now the Hilbert scheme of three points at the origin. And this Hilbert scheme of three points is well known in classical objects. It's a cone over twisted cubic. And you can resolve singularity to compute these uh, sections of the shift. And it's a good exercise for everyone, which is really not so hard, uh, is to say that the dimension of the space of sections is equal to five. So you have Hilbert scheme of three points on C2 at the origin, take space of sections of O of one on that, it's five dimensional. And if you do it equivariantly, you can find equivariant space of sections and the character and everything. And you can check directly, it's also not so hard, that this is the same as the link homology for T3, four. So maybe for this particular example, just again, going back to this equation of Joel and keep going back. So there are three different models for this T3, four. So here you have again, heel three of C2, zero with O of one. And you take homology of that shift. Here, you would have this E6 cluster variety, which I talked about. or this uh, positroid variety P37, I guess. So some open sub variety in the Grassmannian 37, and it gets homology more or less. 
with weight filtration. And here you would have this compactified Jacobian uh, 4, 3, 4 that I talked about uh, last time. So this would be this cone over uh, P1 cross P1 or over here to Brooks surface. So this is again some weird space. And so here again, you have a smooth and non-compact space, uh, and, but it's open in the Grossmannian and you have the weight filtration here. Here, you have a singular space, which you can analyze. So this is this compact by Jacobian of X cube is equal to Y to the fourth. And you take its homology. And again, it's singular, but you can compute everything. And here you would have this single space cube scheme of three points of C to zero, all of one, compute its homology and get the same result. So all of them give the same result and the same as HHH. In this case, we can check everything. But again, the relation between them looks quite mysterious and it still is. Okay, any questions? Okay. Uh, and another example, which maybe I'll gloss over uh, a bit briefly, and that's fine. Uh, so if your braid is the torus knot in general, so I talked a lot about torus knots and the relation to positroid varieties, relation to this compact hydrocarbons. So what do we know here? So here, uh, this was studied in particular in the work of myself and Andre Good. So the shift is actually tricky in general. And to get the shift, we need to consider the nested Hebrew scheme or the fly Hebrew scheme on C2, which also appeared this week. So we look at the space of all flags of ideals, I1 da, 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 up to IN. Uh, and all of them are supposed to support the, the origin in this case. Uh, and on this thing, we have a lot of line bundles where LK is IK minus one mod IK. I K take K minus one's ideal quotient by K's ideal. And this is a line bundle on the nested Hebrew scheme. And roughly speaking, you take push forward of the product of the product of this LI in some powers AI, where AI are these fractional things. So you take integer part of IM over N, I minus one M over N, and then subtract this integer part. Uh, and then use this AI to build a line bundle on the fly Hubert scheme, and then just take push forward of this thing to Hubert scheme. And that's your shift. So that's pretty um, subtle and not obvious at all. And like why this answer is true is an interesting question, which we can discuss. And But this matches, for example, these constructions of Oblonkov and Rosansky, as they checked. And I can explain where these numbers AI come from topologically, but not right now. Uh, and the main subtlety here, which is um, kind of the main obstacle here is that this is really, really singular space as we heard from uh, Richard. So here we use probably related, maybe slightly different uh, construction, but we use some kind of DG structure on uh, flag Hebrew scheme to define this push forward. And so very roughly you say that this is cut out by some explicit equations in some explicit uh, smooth space. And then you just use that to define the virtual structure shift and everything. But again, like it would be nice to have a better understanding, for example, like how this structure that we use here is related to uh, the one that Richard talked about. And I don't know. And like one reason why it's not clear because here we have C2 which is really non-compact. And then uh, he worked uh, on compact surface and that was really important for him. So, I mean, I, I don't know if it is the same structure. In any case, you have some shift here and you can also use lots of tools and previous work of Andre uh, to compute the, at least all the characteristic of the shift on the Hebrew scheme or here uh, and check that it matches what we expect. And then you can ask, well, so all this was about nodes. So when M and N are co-prime, uh, what happens if you have uh, more components? And like the first basic question is what happens for identity break? So if you have just all strands parallel to each other, how to think about it? And to explain the answer for identity braid, I need to introduce some auxiliary spaces. So I need to uh, 
Look at the following Cartesian diagram. So Hilbert scheme of endpoints of C2 projects to Sn of C2. And then uh, you have projection from C2 to the end to Sn of C2, which just quotient by Sn action. And then you take fiber product, which is denoted by Xn. And this was introduced by Mark Heyman, who studied this space a lot. Uh, and in particular, he proved that Xn is the blow up of the C2 to the N along the union of diagonals. So you have N points and we have diagonals where at least two points collide. And you take the union of all such diagonals, blow it up simultaneously, and this is Xn. And then if you will want to unpack this, then X, what is the ideal defining the union of diagonals? So if I's and J's points collide, this is Xi minus Xj. And y i minus y j. This is a code I mentioned to hyperplane. And if I have the union of diagonals, I take the intersection of ideals. And this is this thing j. And so if I blow up, I just take the proj of direct sum of j to the k. So this is very, very explicit blow up construction. And the main thing which uh, Heyman proved is that uh, if you push forward the structure shift of xn down to the Hubert scheme, you don't get O. In fact, you have a remarkable bundle called Prochesi bundle, and this has rank and factorial. So kind of this map on the right is generically and factorial to one. So the left hand side is generically and factorial to one. And what he proved is this is actually flat and do you get a vector bundle uh, of rank and factorial. And so this Prochesi bundle plays a very important role in uh, the study of the Hubert scheme. And we will see it in a second here. Uh, and another thing, so kind of connecting to the nested Hubert scheme, uh, which uh, is important. So you, you can look at the nested Hubert scheme of endpoints on C2, and you have a map to the usual Hubert scheme because you have a flag of ideals, you just forget everything, you just project to the last one, to the last ideal. Or you can fix support of uh, each quotient. So we have this uh, quotient, but we can look at supports of these quotients. There's a n different points. And so we have something in C2 to the n where these quotients are really supported. This is ordered set of points. And so you have a map here, you have a map here. And so by general nonsense, you have a map to the fiber product, to Xn. And so you can define Prochesi either by pushing forward O from here, from the uh, Xn to the Hubert scheme, or by pushing forward O from the flag Hubert scheme down to the Hubert scheme. And this is actually the same, roughly speaking, because for this map, push forward of O is O. And this, we actually, I don't think Heyman proved this, but we proved this like uh, we needed this for something. And this is in our paper with Andre and Jay. Uh, and so again, like if you don't like this kind of weird singular derived DG schemes like flag Hubert scheme, uh, you can just think of this. If you like it, then you can think of it as push forward of O from here down to the Hubert scheme. And somehow this is more natural for me uh, to think about this this way. But if you like kind of classical algebraic geometry, maybe you need to push forward O from uh, Xn down to there. Uh, there was some question, no? Okay. Anyway, so there is some vector bundle of rank and factorial, whatever it is, who cares? And so now the answer is that what do you associate to the trivial braid? You associate just this Prochesi bundle restricted to the Lagrangian subvariety Hill band of C2C. And if you have T and Kn, which appeared a lot, uh, then you. So this is the power of the full twist, and then you associate to it Prochesi bundle times of K restricted to Hill band of C2C. So yeah, I mean, and this is no easier way to describe the shift uh, for the trivial braid and for the powers of the full twist. And in general, for kind of 
braids associated to links with many components. You always expect some kind of purchase bundle or some kind of restricted version of purchase bundle to show up. And this is an interesting feature of this uh, construction. Okay. Uh, and I want to note something because that will be important for us in a second. So how do you actually like, okay, so we believe in this and suppose that we believe in the conjecture, what does it give us? So we have this Hubert scheme of C to C with this uh, vector bundle P times O of K. Uh, so the space of sections here is the same as space of sections upstairs on Xn of C to C, fine, of O of K by projection formula. So this is just the projection formula. And Xn of C to C, well, or Xn at least, we can think of it as a blow up of this C2 to the N. And so we know how to compute the space of sections on a blow up of O of K. This is just the kth power of the ideal that we started from. Uh, so maybe I'll write it as a separate line that if you just look at the sections of Xn with O of K, this will be J to the K. Uh, and if Instead, we have the C to C. Well, we have to quotient by Ys, and that's what we do here. So we quotient by maximal ideal in Ys. And um, well, yeah, I wrote it here already that H0 of Xn of K is J to the K just by this blow up formula. Uh, and then J to the K is actually free over polynomials in Ys. That's not obvious at all, but that was also proved by him. And so to sum up, so if we believe in this conjecture, this says, the conjecture says that this uh, j to the k mod y to j to the k should be the invariant that we associate to n k n torus uh, link. And one theorem from lecture two is that uh, this is actually true. So maybe uh, this is the h h h of t n. Yeah, by lecture two. So we proved that this is actually true. Uh, and uh, so the, in this case, conjecture is true. And that's a very non-trivial check because we have this very non-trivial ideals and stuff. And But of course, this particular computation was a motivation for that theorem. We wanted to prove that the HHH of T and TN is given by this weird formula. And if you remember, so I said that um, this j to the k mod yj to the k, so the way I uh, sketched the proof, I said that you need to deform your homology. So you need to introduce y's and then kill y's like this. So in this sense, you have a shift on the, you want to describe a shift on this Lagrangian sub variety, but it's much more natural to describe a shift everywhere and then restrict to Lagrangian sub variety. And so in some precise sense, this vification business corresponds to extending the shift from uh, Lagrangian sub variety to the whole Hubert scheme of points of zero. And so, uh, right, so let me sketch at least uh, some uh, ideas why this might be true and what is like the relation to other stuff that we know. So the first approach that I certainly don't have time to talk about, and that requires like their own uh, course of lectures by Blomkov and Rosansky, uh, is that uh, what they do, they define a new link invariant. So they say like, forget about HHH. Uh, they use matrix factorizations over some very, very complicated space, roughly related to the flag Hubert scheme of points, or the Hubert scheme of points, but it's like a bunch of Lie groups and Lie algebras, and you have matrix factorization of some complicated potential in there. Uh, and then uh, what they prove is that first of all, this is a link invariant. And secondly, more recently, they proved that this is isomorphic to HHH. And so then how to get from there a sheaf on the Hubert scheme, you just kind of push forward from a heel to heel or from whatever they're set up they're using the critical locus of their potential to the Hubert scheme. But like their theory is intrinsically related to the Hubert scheme. And so it's kind of natural to get a shift from there. 
But the hard part is, of course, to prove that their theory is isomorphic to HHH. And that's what they uh, recently proved. So a different approach, which is like, there are two more approaches which are not completely uh, finished and mostly uh, conjectural, uh, but there is a lot of progress there, uh, is uh, one work of uh, myself and Wedrich and myself and Hockenkamp and Wedrich. So we want to understand lean homology and the solid torus. So uh, this is the same thing as to have a invariance of beta up to conjugation. So we don't require any Markov moves, but we require invariance under conjugation. Uh, and it turns out that, like, if you have seen, I mean, it doesn't matter. Uh, but it turns out that this uh, technology, the right uh, homological algebra language to work with this is the language of derived categorical traces and hostile homologies of categories uh, and things like this. And so we do this for the category of Zorgel bimodules, which governs HHH, we compute something. Uh, and so that is supposed to be related to this arrow between braid varieties and the Hubert scheme. Uh, and roughly speaking, when we have, when we close the braid and we look at this uh, braid link in the solid torus, uh, you can associate to it some kind of derived categorical version of character shifts. Uh, and that's related to, uh, that is supposed to be related to the Hubert scheme, but maybe I don't have time to answer that. But you can ask me later if you're interested, like why this might be related. And, and the thing that I really want to talk about in the last uh, eight minutes is the approach that we initially took with Andre and Jake. And I think this approach still makes perfect sense, except that, again, you need to overcome some homological algebra difficulties. And so the, what we said in the, the original paper, we consider the graded algebra. So what is the graded algebra? So you have a full twist braid uh, corresponding to TNN. And so you have the powers of this full twist braid. This correspond to N, K, N torus braids. And you just take the sum of them all over K, where K goes from zero to infinity. And so this is an algebra because if I tensor ft to the k, if I multiply ft to the k and ft to the l, I get ft to the k plus l. And so by general nonsense, you have a map, multiplication map. If I have a home from r to this guy, and if I have a home from r to this guy, we can multiply tensor these homes and get a home from r to uh, ft to the k plus l. And so this gives a graded algebra structure on this direct sum. So in addition to all this like qt and a, Gradings, uh, we have this extra grading by the power of the full twist. And by lecture two or three, uh, the homology of the kth power of the full twist, the homology of this guy, is precisely j to the k mod yj to the k. So we know this answer, and which I discussed 10 minutes ago, that you can prove conjecture in this particular case. And not only you prove this conjecture, uh, you can, and J is again this ideal of the diagonal in C to the end. Uh, but this, by the virtue of the proof, this agrees with multiplication. So you have this multiplication on the left hand side where with abstract homes from R to FT to the K, and you have multiplication on the right hand side because you have powers of the same ideal. Uh, and this means that this uh, isomorphism agrees with tensor structure with multiplication. So maybe let me, this isomorphism agrees with multiplication. And so not only we know this thing as a vector space or as an X module or XY module, we really know this thing as a graded algebra. And given an arbitrary braid, uh, we can construct this uh, complex of circuit by modules, whatever. But we have naturally a module over this graded algebra because we can take home 
from R to T beta times F to the K. Uh, so this home uh, is a module over this algebra because again, I can add an additional F T to the L in here and get F T to the K plus L. And so this is a graded module over a graded algebra. And so this gives a coherent shift on proj of A and proj of that algebra, as I said, this is exactly this xn of c to c. So that's why I talked about the space xn, because you can write it as a proj of some very explicit algebra. And any graded module over the algebra gives you a shift on this xn. And so in some sense, we're done. And again, the real question is to lift it from this kind of naive computation to the level of uh, DG or derived categories, and this is still uh, not done. But I think like this is one way to go. Uh, and uh, so what we expect, and we write very clearly what should be true that we have some kind of DG funter from the format of a category of sorted by modules to derived category of Hubert scheme of C to C. And it has a lot of interesting properties, which we list quite carefully in that paper. Okay. And so maybe uh, I have a couple of minutes and before saying thank you, I want to comment again on Joel's question. So I didn't really explain where was Joel's question here. So I didn't really explain uh, what is the relation here and what it has to do with character varieties. But here, uh, we have a single curve, like again, how you would expect to, to have it here. And so the idea is to look at the same graded algebra. And so the same graded algebra, so maybe as a note, do it later. I don't know, let's find it put here. So a note, and there's graded algebra. A below, such that the project of A is XN. Can be read, can be seen, and can be identified uh, in the offense story, in the, in the Coulomb branch story. And I think Joel briefly mentioned this last time that you, uh, I mean, you can build your Coulomb branch as spec of some complicated algebra, but you can also build the resolution of Coulomb branch in nice cases as proj of some algebra. And this is exactly this algebra, except that we don't want to get the Hubert scheme, we want to get XN. But this is kind of minor difficulty, which can be uh, overcome, or like we think we know how to overcome. And so one concrete thing about the graded algebras and graded modules we should follow up from this is that you take uh, some gamma in GLN. I think I called it Y last time, whatever. Uh, so we can consider the spring of fiber for gamma. We can consider the spring of fiber for gamma times X. Uh, the spring of fiber for gamma times x square and so on. And then we take the direct sum over k is equal to zero to infinity of homologies of sp gamma times x to the k. And again, this is supposed, this is a graded module over this graded algebra. And so this would be a shift in approach. And one can ask lots of questions like how to explicitly construct the action uh, and how to uh, quantize this and how to 
quantize this graded algebra to some kind of Z algebra that other people studied. Uh, but uh, there is some work on this direction and mostly done by Webster and others. And also there was work in progress uh, by myself, uh, Oscar and the Blanc. And so in some way, I would say one of the key ideas is to identify this graded algebra and to prove that you always have a graded module structure over this graded algebra. And we see it here in this column branch story. And again, to answer Joel's question, it would be great to see this algebra on this side as well. I can some, have some kind of multiplicative structure for starters to have to say that you have braid variety for beta, you have braid variety for beta prime, how do you get the braid to the braid variety of beta beta prime? And that's already not completely obvious to me, but maybe that's my uh, ignorance. Uh, anyway, but uh, if all this is done properly, that uh, here from a curve, you not only consider the curve, you consider kind of the curve with additional full twists. Uh, and this corresponds to Grade module of graded algebra and so coherent shift here. So I think this is kind of more or less direct link from here to here in nice cases, which is still yet to be completely worked out. And I'm over time, so let me say last two things. So first of all, thank you very much, everyone, for coming to these lectures. I think it was great and there were lots of great questions. Uh, great thanks for organizers of the school. I think it's uh, awesome. And I personally learned a lot from um, Richard and Joe's lectures, and I hope to learn more from other lectures. Uh, and an, as an advertisement, if you want to learn more about link homology and some connections to topology, to algebra, geometry, combinatorics, algebraic geometry in particular, uh, I'd like to advertise AIM research community, which you can find by this link. So this is sponsored by American Institute of Mathematics in San Jose. Uh, and uh, this summer we have a lot of reading groups and other activities specifically for grad students. So if you're grad students uh, or postdocs who want to learn more, what is a link homology? Why do we care about this? What are the braid varieties? What are other structures? There are five or six reading groups specifically aimed at these problems. Like how to compute link homology, there is another group. So if you're interested in this, uh, please uh, register here or write me an email and I'll give you all the contacts. So thanks a lot and uh, see you all later. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can I the link? Yes, I can. Any questions? Online, offline? So the, in the P equal W conjecture for uh, curves, uh -huh. you have uh, three spaces. You have this uh, Dovo moduli space, Petit moduli space, Dora moduli space. But uh, here it seems that it's different from the three spaces you have. Here you have just two of them, I think. Uh, so you, you have-, have this Hilbe, Hilbe NC2. Do you have any- No, Hilbe NC2 has nothing to do with like Del Bo or the Rama range. No, 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 this is completely different story. So like the, the, the braid variety and the Hebrew scheme of singular curves, they are, and I always forget, like there are two of the three spaces that I mentioned, that you mentioned. And somehow the relation to Hebrew scheme of C2 is very, very different. So for kind of for character varieties and for P is equal to W, I think the closest analog is the work of Housel, uh, Letelier, Rodriguez Villegas and others. So they say that you can compute uh, von Karepel polynomials of character varieties uh, with weight filtration or with this reverse filtration or the kitchen model space with some extra data. Uh, and so all these things are expressed as some complicated formulas with McDonald polynomials. And so somehow the Hebrew scheme of points keep track of that and it says like all this you can interpret as some shifts on uh, on the Hebrew scheme of points. And Prachese bundle also appear in this work of Housel and collaborators. And so if you've seen that, like that is the closest analog, but this is not part of the, uh, oops. 
It's not part of this non abelian Hodge thing. So the relation to Hilbert scheme of C2 is very different. And like physicists, I think, say that this is some kind of geometric engineering, whatever it is. Uh, I don't know what geometric engineering personally, but that's what they say. But I want to emphasize this is a very, very different thing. So there you're talking about kind of related varieties. Here you suddenly to jump from like studying homology of a variety to homology of a shift on some completely different variety. And so this is very, very different thing to do. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, to continue on the same question, but uh, sort of, you know, the only theory, you have like space in the middle. So like, do, uh, I guess, uh, drum moduli space. Uh -huh. uh, so is there analog of this, like, so something know. between like braid varieties and uh, I don't know. Okay. Uh, that's a very good question. I don't know. Any other questions? So I just put the link to this uh, AIM uh, program to the chat if you're interested in. Great. All right. So let's thank Eugene again for being